hope she traveled. Honoring women who made a difference. Acrylic Kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Louise Zorp, conducted on April 28th by Zach. Children's Home in La Crosse. Um, it isn't here anymore. But um, when I was three years old, my mother and father separated. Today, people get divorces. And they both had to go to work. And so, who would take care of a three-year-old? Home in La Crosse. And it was called the La Crosse Home for Children. And everybody there, there were 25 of us, half girls and half boys. So it was like a big family. And, and they went all the way from age three, which would be the youngest, up through till they would finish high school. So it was, it was like a family. So I lived there from age three until I graduated from college. So I really lived there about 19, 18 or 19 years. It was my home. Most of the children there didn't stay for that long because sometimes one of the parents would remarry or things would work out and they were able to go back. So they were able to go back with their real families. That didn't happen for me. So this, all these children were my family. Now, when I told my granddaughter about this, she's nine. She pictured, uh, she couldn't picture what kind of a building this would be, and she felt kind of scared about the idea. So I have a picture of our home. So right away you can see it was a, a very nice house. And all these rooms were different bedrooms. When you were little and when you were three, you were downstairs. You were called the little kids. And then you got to be the middle kids, and pretty soon you got to be the big kids. So I got to be all of those things. And then when I was bigger, then there'd be other little kids. So Josephine Fletcher was the lady who was in charge of the whole home. She was a real little tiny lady. She was about five foot one. And I'll show you a picture of her. This was later when she later when she was sick and she was older. But by this time I was in college, you know, so this was a lot of years later. But she was a little tiny lady. She'd never been married, so she didn't have any children. So I thought, I wonder how she learned how to be such a good mother, because she never had any children of her own. But somehow she just had the instinct to be a good mother. And besides her, because one person couldn't take care of 25, we had a cook, and then we had some other people that helped take care of us. There were about four adults there that helped us. So, okay, I'll tell you that much, and then I don't want to do all the talking. So that's who Miss Fletcher was, and she was there all the years that I was there. So she was like a mother to me. She was the only mother I knew. Okay. So that's who she was. Okay. Um, do you know like what inspired Josephine to like work there and, or like direct there? You know, I think she had studied social work when she was a younger woman. And that was maybe one of the jobs that social workers did. But she came there before I did, and that was her whole career. She spent all of her years there. Okay. Um, where was the home built, and like when was it built? Um, I moved there in 1936. The home 
was quite old then. I think it used to be a bishop's house. It had been there a long time. And it stayed there until, let me think now, about 1960. And by then it was a pretty old house and it was torn down and a new home was built. And in La Crosse now, that's called the Family and Children's Center. Have you ever heard of that? Yep. It's out on Losey Boulevard. Oh, past Central. That home has children there, but it's a little different than, the, than when I grew up. Because today, children like I was, we were... We were pretty normal, except we didn't have a home. So today, those children go to foster homes. Do you know what foster homes are? Mm -hmm. And there isn't any home like this home, where we were all like a big family. And it was really a very wonderful home. But today, there isn't any home like that. The children today that are at the Family and Children's Center have some problems, usually some emotional problems. Maybe they've been abused, or maybe they've lived with parents that were on drugs, and so they have some emotional problems and they need some help. Now, those children can't go to a foster home because they wouldn't be getting the kind of help they need. So those are the kind of children that live at the Family and Children's Center. And I think they still have their own school there. Kids go to school right there. So there isn't any home like this anymore. Can you describe like what a typical day at the home would be like? Sure. Um, we would probably get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock. Um, a cook had come in earlier. We all went to one big dining room. I wonder if I have a picture of that. And there were there were about six tables in the dining room. The little kids sat at a lower table with lower chairs, and then there were bigger, bigger tables. Every day we got oatmeal or you know what cream of wheat is? Yeah. All those hot cereals. I didn't like them at all. But of course they didn't have a lot of money, so they had to cook one big kettle of soup. We never got cornflakes or anything like that. We thought, boy, that would really be fun. But we would have our oatmeal and toast, and then we'd go to school. Of course, we all walked to school. It was only about three blocks for us to go to school. And then at noon, we'd walk home, and the cook would have some kind of a dinner ready. And we had, you call your dinner, it is your night meal now. Well, we had dinner at noon. That would be our biggest meal. And then we'd have to quick clear the tables and get back to school. And then that cook would go home about three o'clock because she'd been there since seven. But before she'd go, she'd plan what what we were going to have for dinner, and it was usually like more like what you probably have for lunch, sandwiches or something. So then, you know, we could manage that. But when we got home after school, first thing we had to do was change our clothes. I don't know, do you have play clothes? Yeah. 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 Well, you still do. Okay. You had to take your school clothes off because you didn't have very many good clothes. You put on your play clothes, and then. You'd go out and play if you were little, or if you were older, you'd do your homework. And there was always a lot of kids to play with. You know, there's always enough kids to have a kickball game or, you know, whatever. And then we'd play. We had a big yard, was fenced in, and we had slides and swings and all those things. And then we'd have our supper, we called it. And then, again, you'd do your homework or 
play and for Ben. So it's, it was kind of uh, pretty much like probably like your day. Um, were there any like are there any memories that you have from the children's home that really stick out in your mind or some events that happened that were either sad or just something that you really remember? Well, let's talk about happy events first. Um, we were lucky because we all got to go to the Y. It was only a few blocks away and the Y let the children from the children's home come without peeing. And so, you know, we got to do a lot of things. On Saturday afternoon, we had a free pass to go to the movies. That was pretty neat because we couldn't have gone otherwise. We got to do a lot of things because people in the lacrosse community liked the children's home and they, they gave us things and uh, but, you know, it wasn't all happy either because, you know, I had friends from school who all lived at their own homes. And they had a mother and a father. Just about everybody did. And I always thought, gee, I wish I, I, wish I had a mother and a father. And I always felt, um, sometimes when you're young, you, you, think things are a certain way, even if they aren't, but I always felt kind of embarrassed because I lived at the children's home. And yet, the neighbor kids that lived around us, who would come over and play in our yard, they all wanted to live where we did. They thought we had everything great, and I thought they had it great. So you see, you ever heard this story, the grass is always greener on the other side? You always think other people have it better. And yes, there were many times when I felt embarrassed because I lived there. And, and people would say, oh, she lives at the home. And, and, you know, what did that mean? I don't know, but I didn't like it. And I always thought it'd be really neat to have a mother and a father. But when I got to be an adult, I found out that not all mother and fathers are good either. And some some people that lived with their mothers and fathers maybe weren't as happy as I was. Okay. Um, could you tell me a little bit about um, Josephine's personality? Yes. She was a wonderful person and she even though there were 25 of us she could look at each individual and say well you know you really like arithmetic and so she'd find special ways that you could excel I liked to knit and sew and I did things I took some piano lessons we had a piano there and a lady would come in and give lessons. So she knew which children would be interested in that. She had a, a wonderful way of treating each one as an individual. We didn't all do the same things. And if you were a real good student in school, she encouraged you. She said, you know, you keep getting good grades and then you can go on and go to college. So. I, I still don't know how she was so smart because she, she didn't have her own children, but she just was a natural mother. Um, would the children's home pay for you to go to college, or would you? Have paid no, um, I I was lucky to go to college, and when I went to Central, graduated from Central, I got a scholarship because I had good grades. And then, normally when you graduated from high school, you moved away from the children's home because this was supposed to be for children. But they allowed me to stay there and I worked. I would go to college and then I'd come home and I'd be like one of the adults. I would help get the supper on the table and I would help with the younger children. So that was how I was able to go 
to college by having a scholarship and by working. And I went to learn how to be a medical technologist. And that's a person that draws your blood and does blood tests and things of that sort. I had three children of my own, and they always said my mother the vampire. She takes blood out of people, that's what they called me. But here's a picture when I graduated from Central, and then this is when I graduated from college. So I was there from 1936 to 1954. That was a long, long, long time. And here is when I got married, and here was Miss Fletcher. She was in a wheelchair by then, but she was able to come to my wedding. Whose idea was it to make the children's home, and who like made it possible? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that happened quite a while before I was there, and there, was, there were people there before Miss Fletcher came. Um, and of course, there was always a need for a place for children that didn't have any parents. So I, re I really don't even know who started it, but she was there for all of the years that I was there. Did Josephine have like any role models or people who really supported what she was doing? Yes, she the. the People in the community were so impressed with what she was doing that that was why the community helped so much. We all went to the dentist. Well, who was going to pay for the dentist? There wasn't any money. So she would call up each dentist and say, would you be willing? To, to take over the care of one person. Could Zach be your patient? And they just loved her so much, they said, sure, we'd be happy to. So each one of us went to the dentist, fell into different dentists, but that dentist took care of us all those years that we lived there. And that was the same way with doctors and People in the community respected her so much that they were willing to help out. I guess I didn't answer your question about her role model. You know, I really don't know. Okay. That's okay. I'm sure she had one, but I'm not sure who that was. Um, was she involved with the League of Women Voters? Yes, I think she was a member of that. And um, do you know how she got involved with that? I just assume that other women invited her to join. That that would be my guess. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, how do you think uh, she paved the way for some future women? Well, she paved the way for me and the other people that she raised, because then when I went out in the community, I wanted to return some of that goodwill that had been given to me. And I worked with the new children's home and, and helped them. And I taught my children that they were very lucky because they had a mother and a father and that they always needed to be kind to children that didn't have parents because they felt bad about that. Um, she paved the way for many of us that she raised because we grew up with an attitude of giving to others to, to pay back what had been given to us. She was very well loved. What was like her motivation I think she became very attached to the children she raised. I was there for 18 years. She saw me go from a three-year-old to 
to a 20 year old. I think she actually felt like her mother in many ways. Um, I'm sure that was motivation. I, of course, am telling you mostly about the girls, but now there were 12 boys there too. And, and she was just as good with boys. And many of them went on to do good things later in life too. Were you able to like be involved with like sports for the kids? Yes, because well, first of all, we went to the Y and school sports, and um, of course, we always could have our own games at home. We had a big yard; it was like a whole block that was fenced in. Um, I was never really good at sports, but some of the kids were. Of course, we had roller skates. We could skate around the block. We couldn't go much further than that. Um, I, I think th there weren't teams. Like, you guys probably all have a chance to be on some kind of a uh, summer little league. or there were, They didn't have those sorts of things. But um, I guess it was mostly through school and the Y. They would get to go to Y camp, the boys. The boys went to Boy Scout camp. Girls went to Girl Scout camp. Uh, how do you think she got started in this home? You know, I just think that they were looking for somebody for this job and she just came along and applied and somebody knew she'd be good at it. And um, she did have training in social work, so she knew quite a bit about how to raise children. Uh, did she ever get paid for this? Or was it yeah, paid? she got a small amount of money and Every year in June, we had what was called a lawn party. And that, oh, we didn't like that because we all had to really clean up our rooms good and get everything perfect. Because on that day, everybody from the city of La Crosse was invited to come and walk through and see the home. And we had to be like your, your being today we had to meet people, and they served ice cream, but then people made a donation. And the people in La Crosse donated enough money that that's what ran the children's home. And she got a salary out of that, so some of that went to her. Did you ever have to, like, did all the children have, like, their own room, or did you have to share rooms? No, we shared rooms. When you were little, there were five in a room. You all had your own bed. But then when you got bigger and moved upstairs, there were rooms with three beds and four. And then when you got to be a big kid, then the rooms had two beds in them. You never had your own room. Was there ever like a time when there were so many kids that needed to come to the home that like you couldn't take them all? Or is yes. There time? 25 was like the limit because that's all the beds we had. And there were always more children that needed to have homes. Now, none of us were adoptable. You know, you couldn't come and adopt us because we all had a parent living somewhere. It's just that they couldn't take care of us. Now there was another home in La Crosse and that was called St. Michael's and that was called an orphanage where those were children who either didn't have parents or their parents didn't want them and those children could be adopted but we were not, none of us were ever adopted. Did the parents ever, like, come to visit you, or...? Some children did have parents that would come. I didn't. My parents lived in California. But um, some parents did, and we always thought, boy, are they ever lucky. 
because, you know, if the parents would come, they might bring them a little bag of candy or something, you know. So you never got any money from your parents? or No. no. You really didn't have any contact with them? No, I didn't. Uh, were there any, like, special, like, Christmas? What did you do on Christmas and Thanksgiving? Christmas was, was very special. We'd have a big uh, Christmas tree. There's one picture here from Christmas. This one. And there were some special people in La Crosse that loved the children's home. And there was one rich man, I remember that. And every Christmas, we each could pick out one thing we really wanted, one really nice toy, which was probably about $10, which was a lot of money then. So you could get a, like a pair of skates for $10, or you could get something pretty nice. And we each got to think and think about what we wanted. And then this list would go to this man, and he would come on Christmas Eve and watch us open these gifts. And of course, he got a lot of pleasure from it, too. He didn't have any children of his own. But this, I remember, was Christmas morning. And here's all the girls lined up, and we all got a doll. And this one is me. And here's our dolls up here. This was in a room we called the playroom, and we had a lot of books in the bookshelves there. This is we're playing. It looks like we had an old inner tube or something. This is me. Christmas was very special. Um, other than that, we did each get a stocking. Miss Fletcher would stuff a stocking for each of us, and there'd be some oranges and nuts and things like that, and maybe a couple little toys. But she'd sneak around after dark, you know, the little kids, pretend it was Santa. Um, Thanksgiving. We always had a big turkey that somebody would bring us, you know. We had holidays. Um, our very special holiday was 4th of July, and one of the ice cream companies in La Crosse would bring five of these, you know, these big uh, cartons of ice cream, like if you go to an ice cream store, at least. and all day long we got to have ice cream. 10 in the morning, we got an ice cream cone. At noon, at 2, and that was always on the 4th of July. That was always a special day for us. Did you guys have, like, a, for Easter, did you guys have, like, a big Easter egg hunt? Um, you know, I don't, I don't remember that we did. I suppose it would have been too many eggs. <laughs> I don't think they had plastic eggs back then. Oh, like, no. You know, so it would have had to have been real eggs. But I can remember when I was going to maybe first grade, and every child was asked to bring an egg from home because we were going to call our eggs at school. So I went into the kitchen and I told the cook, I have to take an egg to school. Well, I didn't tell her it had to be cooked. I just said I need an egg. So I carried the egg all the way to school. It was about two blocks. And then the teacher said, well, you have to have this egg cooked. So I carried it all the way home again. And I went to the kitchen and I started to tell the cook about this egg and I dropped it. Got it all the way to school and all the way home and then I dropped it. And of course it broke on the floor. <laughs> I just remember that. And that was probably Easter time that that was happening. I'm sure we had fights, just like brothers and sisters do. Um, I don't really remember a lot of fights, but I know the boys would fight with each other and, you know, do all some, uh, what do boys do when they get on the floor? They wrestle, wrestle and all that kind of stuff. It was a pretty normal home, did all of those things. What about for birthdays? Did you guys have like a birthday cake? Yes, you, you had a birthday cake on your birthday. And I don't think we got a present, but you did get a birthday cake. But now we, 
in our dining room, I told you, we had like five tables. And the women that worked there, like right after lunch, and the dishes were washed, they set the table, you know, for the next meal. The table was always set ahead of time. <coughs> and when we'd have cake, it was cut in the kitchen, and if there were six of us at a table, there were six pieces put on a plate, uh, you know, on each table. So, and Miss Fletcher was very aware of table manners, and she was always trying to teach us good table manners. One of the things she said was, when you sit down and there's a plate of cake in front of you, you take the piece that's closest to you, because that's good manners. So if you got to the table first, you turn the plate around so the biggest one was facing you. <laughs> or sometimes when the kids got bigger, I think it was probably the boys, they'd stick their finger in the piece they wanted because then nobody else would take it. Slept in the basement, and every morning the first one up could go and open the door and call him up, and he'd come upstairs. And one morning he wouldn't come up. So we went down to see what was the matter with him, and he had a new batch of kittens. So we found out that Mr. McIntosh was not a mister after all, but that was still his name because we'd had him so long. Did you guys get to like, keep the kittens? You know, I think we got to keep a couple of them. Um, I don't know how many are on this picture, but I think he had about five or six picture of them. Well, what kind of disciplinary did we have? Oh yes. We, when you got to be an older big kid, you always thought it was neat to be a big kid, but, but when you got to be a big kid you also had to do jobs. And if you were a girl and you were one of the big kids, then you got to do help do the ironing. And, of course, there were big boys, but nobody made the boys do ironing. So I probably had to iron your shirts. And so they would sort out the ironing, and you'd come home from school, and there would be your pieces you were supposed to do on your bed. Well, we didn't want to do that. We did our own ironing. And then we'd take the boys' shirts and we'd roll them up in a ball and stick them in our drawer and hide them. Well, pretty soon the boys ran out of shirts. I said, well, where are, where are all my shirts? So Miss Fletcher would go in our room when we were in school because she knew. And she'd look in our drawer and she'd find the shirts and she'd pull them out and lay them on her bed. And when we got home, we got scolded. Sometimes we lost privileges. And we had then we had by then we had a lot of shirts to iron. I remember one year my punishment was I couldn't take any Valentines to school. And when I was in school in third and fourth grade, everybody had a shoe box and you covered it. And if I brought Valentines I would to put one in everybody's box. I couldn't take any Valentines. And that was very embarrassing to me. I, we, um, what kind of other punishments did we have to do? We'd have to do extra cleaning, um, lose privileges, we couldn't go to extra things, couldn't go to the movies, maybe on Saturday. I don't think we ever got spanked. I remember if you swore, you were going to get a bar of soap in your mouth. And I got that a couple times. <laughs> I don't know what what swore, swear words we knew, but they must have been something we knew. <laughs> um, for transportation, did you guys walk everywhere that you went? Yeah. We walked. Once in a while, we got to take the bus. Down on the corner, the bus went by, but 
you know, you had to have money for the bus. But like even the movie, which would be downtown, we'd walk, you know, four or five of us would go together and well, maybe it was a mile or so, but you know, when you're young, that's not far. Oh. And it was safe in those days. Children could could walk downtown by themselves. You, know, you didn't worry about some of the things you worry about today. Uh, I, is there anything you would like to say to uh, her uh, that you didn't say to her? Well, I, yes, I would certainly like to thank her for being my mother. I, I think I took time to do that when I got to be a mother myself, an adult. Um, but I guess I, I would need to tell her, after I got to be a mother, how I, I still marvel at how she was so insightful to know what to do with all of us. And she knew exactly what each one needed. And every child had, had some special needs, you know, certain things they needed. And she just knew how to do that. And I guess I would have to thank her for that. Did Josephine still impact your life when you got older, like when you got out of college? Oh, sure. Because when I had three children, and they were when they were about six and eight and nine, and they always asked me about, you know, they'd like to hear the stories about it. And I said, you know, this Christmas, instead of having so much, you need to each think of something you'd like to give the children's home. And I would have them go with me to the new children's home and take gifts and they learned to be very uh, compassionate children because I told them, don't you know, don't stare at people if they're different, or don't don't make fun of them. I have an autistic grandson. Do you know what autism is? Yeah. He's 15, and he's my grandson. So. His mother was my daughter, and so she's done the same thing. She's taught her children. You don't make rude comments to people. You know, sometimes people with autism act strange. And you don't stare at them. You don't make mean remarks to them. But, you know, if nobody's told you that at home, you might do it. She taught us a lot of, of good things, um, to be appreciative for what we got, and to be kind to other people, and to always write thank you letters. This podcast brought to you from across Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School, in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.